Good evening, everybody. We're going to dive right into our uh, screen sharing and get us into part two. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I appreciate each one of you. It's uh, always a joy to spend time with you. <clears throat> hopefully you're all well. And anybody listening, hopefully you're well. Tonight we're going to uh, continue our journey to kind of build the context. Again, I want to point out if you have questions, feel free to ask or feel free to text them through the group chat. Um, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand the context. Um, I think when a lot of times when people will teach on the Civil War, perhaps because of a limitation in time, um, they will teach the war pretty much with Lincoln's election right off the bat, you know, being kind of day one. And then you go on into the war itself and what happened between 61 and 65. But I don't think that helps most people really gain the insight that they need for why. And so last week, what we looked at was the early founding of the country, how slavery was embedded at the beginning, and how different aspects of what it meant from their philosophical point of view with Locke and Hobbes to create a system or tension in the system of why the country is designed the way it's designed. And then we saw then in that design that that automatically led individuals and organizations and groups and large organizations that eventually we'll call states to think of themselves in a independent way compared to the nation. Um, we today, you see this in our English verbiage, we today will use the United States as a singular noun. So if we're talking about the Olympics, we'll say the United States is playing the basketball game in the Olympics. But prior to about the 1880s, and certainly prior to the Civil War, the United States was always a plural noun. So had they had the Olympics at that point, they would have said the United States are playing in the Olympics. And so you can just sense right from the beginning that there wasn't a common view of creating what we would call a normal, but a unified nation. Instead, they were creating, well, as they called it, a confederation. And then we saw Madison change that, but, but even in the changing, that did not eliminate the fact that there were people who perceived things from an isolated, or we might say narrow, viewpoint that was Lockean first, and believed that they, having joined this confederation, could leave this confederation. So right off the, right off the bat, uh, under President Washington, well, actually, even in the ratification of the, of the Constitution, Rhode Island and North Carolina did not join. And in Rhode Island's case, there was some serious conversation of maybe them going their own way. Um, and then within the first, um, right at the end of the first uh, term of President Washington into the second term, you have the Whiskey Rebellion in which the western part of Pennsylvania, those people considered seceding and perhaps joining Canada or going their own way. And so throughout the country's history, you see that, and that was led us, we got up to 1820 in the Missouri Compromise. And while there wasn't really a major discussion about, the, about secession in the Missouri Compromise, there was this sense in which it was in the undercurrent, right? They, they weren't even, they weren't necessarily expecting to talk about slavery. Had you gone and talked to national leaders in 1818 and you said, hey, do you think there's going to be a battle about slavery? They would have said, no, why would there be? Because nobody's really talked about it in the past decade. Of course, you have the War of 1812. So that, you know, that has a lot to do to, you know, impact what people were focused on. Um, but nonetheless, it really caught them by surprise. However, it highlights that as we move west and you raise the issues of land ownership, of property ownership, and what it means to be in this union, that that's not settled, any tension is going to provoke more division. And slavery would be a passionate topic, particularly as we'll see in a moment, what transpires out of the, out of the Second Great Awakening. Now, again, slavery wasn't supposed to be a big issue. And so there's a question, you know, people are like, well, why was it? Well, if you go back to the founding, so back into the 1600s, it wasn't so much that anybody thought about slavery per se, but they acknowledged that the Southern colonies, uh, Georgia through Maryland and somewhat Delaware, had all been founded with an economy that was agrarian, a focus on cash crops. 
but the cash crops that they knew of did not really seem like they would extend. In Georgia and South Carolina, it was rice and indigo. In North Carolina and um, uh, in North Carolina and Virginia, it was tobacco. And so there wasn't really a thought of this will easily expand. And thus, one of the reasons why the founders <clears throat> were a little bit more willing to be flexible with Southerners to preserve all 13 colonies was because they thought, well, you know, this will die out. Well, of course, no one could have predicted the coming of the cotton gin, nor could they have predicted the growth in the early Industrial Revolution. So early re Industrial Revolution is late 1700s, early 1800s, really probably up to the 1850s, loosely. How, when you were in college, just like I was in college, you often heard them talk about the first Industrial Revolution, and then later the second. That's not really how it's discussed now, it's just the Industrial Revolution with an early focus and then a, a later or modern focus. And the growing, the, the number one power in the Industrial Revolution in the early phase was textiles. That's because water was a big deal, so steam power became a really big deal in the early Industrial Revolution. But the textile industry had an explosion. And of course, as we all know, wearing cotton is more comfortable than wearing, say, flannel or a fleece uh, or wool. And so when they were able to figure out a way to get cotton in a massive quantity, if you've ever been in a cotton field, I have, if you're in, it's, it's, not a, it's not a happy experience. And it's very difficult, nigh impossible, to be able to, to harvest enough cotton by hand in a way that doesn't, you know, ruin the, the workers' hands to where they're no good the next day. And so all of a sudden this explosion, um, as you can see on the map there, just spread throughout the South, particularly the lower South, because all of the Western Georgia, kind of the middle part of South Carolina, all through Alabama, Western Tennessee, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, and into Missouri, um, and then Western Te uh, Eastern Texas, all was perfect for growing cotton. So you had this kind of perfect storm where there was a product that needed mass labor in a society that used slaves for mass labor that was going to produce massive wealth at this kind of moment in which the product you could produce would perfectly situate for the industry that's growing. So, you know, it's just all set up. And as you can see by the 1830s, 40s, the South were it its own nation would have been third or fourth richest nation in the world. Well, so that all that, uh, you know, that cash really was important. I try to tell my students about this because, you know, again, we, most of us, I'm sure all of you, um, you know, believe slavery is bad and would not want to see it existing. But what I tell the students is imagine that your family did something um, that some people thought was immoral, but your grandfather was making in today's money the equivalent of, you know, 10, 15, 20 million dollars a month. And he, you know, you were getting an allowance of $500,000 a month from your parents. Would you give that money up just because someone came along and said you were immoral? Most of us wouldn't. Maybe some of us are better people and we would, but most of us would not. And that's kind of where the South begins to go. As, as cotton spreads, you can see slavery spreads right along with it as cotton production grows on this river. You just look at the two maps side by side here and you go, oh, okay, I get it. And it wasn't just cotton. There were other industries. Tobacco is still powerful in North Carolina and Virginia. Rice and indigo were still powerful in South Carolina and, and on the coast of Georgia, a little bit of North Florida. Um, but cotton was king. Cotton was, was the dominant factor. And so as you have this growth, you begin to have kind of a change between the South and the North. And so sectionalism becomes this aspect in which we notice that the different sections of the country are going in different directions. And, and that, that potentially is a problem. It will be one of the key reasons for the Civil War, but at this stage, they're not certain about that. The South had started off agrarian, and because it was agrarian from the beginning, you know, in the 1600s, and you had plantation owners owning thousands of acres of land, the first ones coming over, um, you automatically developed a South that was rural compared to the North, in which while there were very large farms in, say, parts of New Jersey, um, Western Pennsylvania, Central Pennsylvania, you know, kind of 
midway New York between the Adirondacks and New York City, um, they still were not as big as the southern farms. And as the southern farms becoming cash crop farms, the more you plant, the more you make, grew larger and larger. As new residents came, they naturally spread out to do the same industry. So you have very few cities, um, New Orleans, Atlanta to some degree, um, obviously near DC, so Richmond to some degree, but, but largely the South was very, very rural and it based its economy, again, third or fourth richest in the world, but all on one economy. Now we all know that's very dangerous because if something happens, so, you know, they tried to diversify. Washington, actually, General George, President Washington, um, he was one of the first uh, in the you know, middle to late 1700s trying to push his fellow planter class to diversify. And, and he, he really did diversify Mount Vernon, but others didn't because, again, the money was too good. If you can make, if you're going to make three times more doing it this certain way, then if you diversify, why would you do that? And so they didn't. Um, and, it, and it grew along. I mean, you have planters that were very, very wealthy. And as they had third and fourth sons who would not get the farm, you know, they would send, you know, they would buy 500 acres, 1,000 acres, you know, 1,000, 1,500 miles, you know, to the, to the west, you know, and help their son or their children for, create a new farm with their own slaves. And so you really don't have anything but an agrarian slave-based economy. Now, again, pay attention. The North's not immune. One of the things that Southerners got really incensed about through the 1840s and 1850s was the suggestion from the abolition movement that this was a Southern problem. And they were like, no, no, hang on a second. You guys are benefiting from this. And this is true. Um, the North, even if they didn't notice, right? So many people would not have noticed. When we get to uh, Harry Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin book, one of the important parts of it was highlighting the idea that slavery was not a good thing, that it still existed, that it had grown larger, and that it had evil in it. Um, and many people in the North were like, we didn't even know this. But that doesn't mean that they were immune from the fact that slavery was benefiting them, because even if they were just a factory worker, those factories existed in um, a complicated web around the textile industry. It's no different than post-World War II, you all remember, and I still know that we have some of this issue today, uh, our debates and, and conversations about the military industrial complex. And it's not like you can just pull one industry out and not impact the surrounding society. And we know that economically there's a web that gets developed with grocery stores and gas stations and and plumbers and electricians and doctors and dentists who are all connected behind kind of one major industry. Um, so in the North, the textile industry was that, and that was based on getting cotton from the South. So it was a massive, massive thing. Now, this we have to look for a moment, just a, a brief moment, about what was life like in the South, because this is this gets really complicated. Just just so we're really clear. Uh, in fact, I was having a conversation with someone today, not about this, but about some other issue. And I said, you know, most people just don't want to have the nuance, but we're going to have to have some nuance here. And so I just, I, you know, ask for your patience. Again, don't hesitate to ask a question if you want to ask me something. The majority of Southerners never owned slaves. Now, let's be clear, the majority of Southerners would have wished to have owned a slave. Owning a slave was a, was a statement about wealth. So much like today, you're probably like me, you don't have stock in Apple, you didn't buy stock in Google when it came out. If you did, you only have a little bit. Maybe some of you, maybe you do, <laughs> maybe you're wealthy. Um, but most of us, you know, we can't, we didn't get into the tech revolution when it, other than just a, I have a computer and I enjoy, you know, that, that side of it. But, you know, if you could, you would. If you could be somebody who started making $500,000 every month, you would. Most of us would. Um, and so, you know, to the white South, there, there's always an economic division in well, all societies, and certainly all regions of our country, and the economic division in the South was between a planter elite, who we'll see in a moment, um, always, you know, they owned the most slaves, like 150, 200 slaves on very, very large plantations, and they were a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage. And then there's everybody else, and then there's a very poor rural white South, very poor, in the majority of people. 
um, would have been in this category. My family, who was living in East Tennessee at this time, um, having moved from Western North Carolina about the 1820s, 1830s, um, we were very poor, just you know, basic regular people, did not own any slaves. But most, most would have supported slavery, and early they would have supported like the founders did, considering it a necessary evil. As we're about to see, due, due to what happens in this Industrial Revolutionary moment that is all connected to the American system, which we've studied in, in this Westminster class before, um, you know, it, it's going to, the economic piece is going to become a real critical aspect of, of where we're going. And so you can see that even though we might wish or think that poor Southern whites might have not rebelled, but, but demanded that diversification, demanded some change, they didn't. They were, they were largely comfortable in the way they lived, um, which we would find excessively poor. Um, and there was all these connections to, to the planter class, to see them to some degree like a nobility. So that, be, that raises a kind of a psychological issue uh, in the story as they go along. Most slaveholding families, so now we're talking about, like I said here, basically 25%. So of the 25%, about 90% owned five or fewer. So about 85, 90% owned five or fewer. So that doesn't give them a pass. They still owned a human being as a piece of property. But when we think of the Southern story, we think of Gone with the Wind, which is obviously right in the news right now. We think of that big plantation story. Um, we, we kind of, many of us have visited Mount Vernon. So that's kind of one living uh, testimony to the big plantations, what they look like, you know, big famous white house, lots and lots of land, worked by lots and lots of slaves. Um, and that's not the norm. The norm actually was a typical small farm, one to five slaves. Um, the slave to some degree would be almost like what we would consider today somebody having a hired hand uh, who would come to the house every day to do a variety of work. Um, for someone, um, mowing the grass, taking care of the car, those kinds of things, or even having a housekeeper. Um, people may have a housekeeper and, you know, and we pay them, but same basic experience. And then you work your way up. There was a middle section. You can see there on the chart, kind of the, the 10 to 50 range was kind of this middle section, kind of, kind of the yeoman farmer, kind of the person who was, I guess we would say economically middle class, um, and then, of course, the planter elite at the very, very top. Now, this, this allowed for kind of a, a, a paternalistic viewpoint about how society was understood, not just slavery, but how society was understood. I mean, you, you will hear when we get to the end of our time and we look at, I think we'll do this, not today, I mean, at the end of the whole thing, we'll look at Reconstruction, which I think is the, the great failure that's led us to the story we're living in right now, um, the lost cause myth is to some degree connected to uh, a loss of the, the chivalric viewpoint. Well, chivalry is the Middle Ages, and as we just studied in looking at the Reformation period, the Renaissance period, it was the ethos of this tiny elite at the top, economically driven, you know, nobility, controlling everybody else in a way that, you know, you had no rights whatsoever. So for Southerners to kind of aim at that as a positive good is interesting because it's not really what the Middle Ages people would have said. And it certainly wasn't even what our founders said. Our founders, to some degree, come to create the society that they create in a rejection of that notion that there should be a planter elite and this is one of the reasons why you're going to see this division of sectionalism when uh, John Adams and Jefferson go at it with each other when Jefferson is his vice president and quite honestly basically commits treason and betrays Adams in the run up through the quasi war with the French that led to some of the issues in 1796 to 1800, the, the press, which was all kind of maneuvered by Jefferson were basically accusing Adams of being an elitist. And Adams would tell Abigail, how am I an elitist? My dad was a cobbler. I'm just a poor boy made good, put myself through law school and you know, maybe I'm kind of smart. Whereas Jefferson, who was being proclaimed as a man of the people, 
was actually like a pseudo nobility living on a mountaintop, nobody around, hundreds of slaves, just like the, the old nobility. And Adams could not understand how people were kind of buying this hook, line, and sinker. It's interesting also that as you look at this paternalism and you move into the 1830s and 40s, the ideas of the founders of, a, of slavery being a necessary evil begins to shift. And you can see that in how the slave owners thought of themselves. Well, obviously, life for the slave was anything but enjoyable. Um, and, and so there's a tension in that mix there because you, you would have had some slaves not experiencing the beatings, the rapes, the, the selling of families off. And maybe even the majority would not have experienced that. But that doesn't mean, you know, any one of us would volunteer to go back and be a slave or one, our, one of our relatives to, be, to become a slave. So the Southerners by 1830 are shifting the description in a way to say, you know, actually slavery is good. They would point to things like the economy in the North. Uh, they would point to the idea um, that there was benefit to the slave, comparing them to what their life must have been like in Africa, although they would not have known what that was like. Uh, they would point to things like both the giving of Christianity, really the making um, slaves be Christians, as well as the fact that the Bible never comes out and says you should stop slavery, uh, which the New Testament doesn't say that. Um, and, and so there's just like this idea that begin to kind of weave this story that slavery was this positive good, and that will become kind of a defining factor that really will push us towards the Civil War in the 1840s and 1850s. But we can't forget that slaves were considered property. There was never a moment when a slave had any legal rights whatsoever. Um, they were denied all of what we would consider, you know, Basic, if, if Locke is giving us the idea of life, liberty, and property is as a basic foundation merely because you're alive, well, I guess the slaves were given life. They were allowed to still live, but they weren't given their freedom, so they didn't have the liberty, and they weren't given any property. They, they basically had nothing that they could really call their own independently of the master and of the plantation itself. Um, one of the worst things that would be done, or I guess we would say, you know, was done, is the idea that they were never taught to read and write. Now, that's understandable, right? I mean, from a sense, if you want to control a people, particularly if they initially, at least, are people from another country. Now, by the 1830s and 40s, every, almost every slave was a product of the slave system. This is why the Southerners were so willing to accept the 1809 um, trade um, ban when it came up. They didn't fight it in 1809 because by that point they realized they had enough slaves they could really create a secondary income stream by creating, birthing, and selling slaves. Again, hopefully that turns your stomach. Hopefully you're like, oh, that's terrible. Yeah, it was. Um, and that again is that planter class. If you're one of the low farmers with two, three slaves, you're not selling anybody, right? Um, so, so it's a little bit of a different story, but that upper group, so of course you would teach them to read and write, but if you're going to claim that it's a positive good, and you're going to make one of the claims suggesting that it is a positive good because it does a benefit to the slave, him or herself, then by not teaching them to read and write, I mean, that's one of those things where you'd say, huh, is it really about it being a positive good, or is it about control? Um, the one freedom that they would have had was the ability to spend time in church on Sundays. This is why if you ever study um, society today and you have ever visited what would be considered a black church or an African-American church, you will find typically compared to most of white churches, um, a much, much longer service, either the sermon itself or just the overall experience of the church. And that's legacy all the way back to the slave days because that'd be the one time where most of the masters, even the bad masters, would typically leave the slaves alone. And so as long as they were in church, they were okay. And so some, some slave churches would start as early as possible, like eight o'clock, and would go as long as the master would allow them, late into the afternoon. So they would have that one window of time where they could have some freedom. That also explains why so often in our, in our you know, past hundred years, where the ministers of the African-American community are held in such high esteem, 
If that's you've ever wondered about that, that's a, that's a piece of the puzzle. It is important to note um, that when you compare, particularly to the to Latin America, South America, um, I, the slaves would not have had as horrible experience as can be portrayed. So if if Hollywood can portray um, romantically with the Gone with the Wind story, the plantation class in kind of this rose-eyed glass, beautiful, isn't it lovely, and to thus misrepresent, right? When Hollywood or news presents slavery as a consistent torture, that's also a misrepresentation. Um, now, it's not, it's not because the white South was, was kind or good, and some, some of them, yes, that's exactly why. Um, they were good people in, in, to the level that you can say good and still own slaves. I understand it's complex. Like I said, it's nuanced. But for most, it was a business decision. So we're not trying to praise them necessarily. We're just trying to highlight the fact that we're not going to say, you can't say that every slave was beaten, every slave was raped, every slave family was split up and sold you know, down the river, every child born was sold into slavery. That's inaccurate. Um, that's true. What I'm saying is true, but the reasoning isn't necessarily one to, to glorify or, or sort of necessarily benefit and say, oh, wow, look how nice the South was. It was purely an economic position because, remember, it's a business. So no different, I tell my students, no different than if your dad or your grandfather owned a business that you were a part of and they had a fleet of 20 trucks or they had, you know, 20 machines in the factory that ran whatever it is that your family does. You wouldn't mess with those. You wouldn't want to see those destroyed. Having made the financial investment, you'd want it to last as long as possible. So it is true that slaves were fed, they were given housing, they were given health care, um, they, were, they were taken care of in the sense of prolonging their lives as long as possible. So it's complicated. Um, nonetheless, I'll make sure you hear me well, it's not like slavery is a good thing. None of us are volunteering to go become slaves, and we, we're glad that it's over at least in this form you do know slavery is not over. The tragedy of our day is that slavery is alive and well in the world. Um, 40 to 50 million people are enslaved globally, and there are slaves in this very state and in this very city. And we'll talk about that more later if you're interested in that story. So we keep going. There were some free slaves or free blacks um, who had either bought their freedom, uh, most of them had bought their freedom, or had been granted freedom by a master, at some point, somebody dying allowed them to have the freedom. And believe it or not, um, they were allowed some, afforded some rights in that they weren't just automatically captured and you know taken back, you know, to to slavery. Right? They everybody knew that was Carl. He used to be a slave. Now he's free. He's got his papers, and he does this job. He does this thing. It's always curious to me personally why they would want to stay in the South, why they didn't want to stay in those places. For some, it was because they were married, so they had loved ones who were still um, on plantations. And then for others, I think it's just the limitation of knowledge of knowing, well, where else would I go and what would I do? And here they might have had a, 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 some sort of a place, like a blacksmith or made wagons or did some kind of a thing that allowed them some opportunity. You can see they did not have a, the same level of rights um, but nonetheless, there was that piece of the puzzle for them. Well, so this is the status quo. So the cotton is growing. The South is experiencing economic boom. There's a division of economic boom, which we think might challenge poor white people to demand some changes, but they don't really. Most of them would have said, I, my hope is to get a slave one day and get a few more acres and then I'll, I'll make some money. And so, well, what changes? Because right now, it seems like we're on a certain trajectory. Remember, a body in motion stays in motion until something else acts upon it. So what's the force? Well, the force is the second great awakening. The second great awakening comes. Now, I've told you before, we talked about this when we did the series back last year, uh, or maybe early, I'm sorry, January, about the, the, the great power cycle that I, that I believe very deeply in. We've talked about that in any case. And in the process of that, there's this 80-year pattern that kind of cycles with from kind of a 
spring to winter, to use that metaphor, from, from happy to crisis. We're in the crisis of the most recent 80 year period, if you can't, if you can't tell. Um, but in the middle of that, or kind of woven with it like a helix, perhaps a double helix, there is another 80 year cycle of spiritual awakenings. And so you can back those or go forward from those. So the first one of those is in 1740, 80 years later, 1820s, the second one of these comes and explodes out for us. Now, you know, if we were focusing on the religious side of this, which we're not going to take the time to do that, the thing, there's a lot I can tell you, obviously. The, the, the big takeaway in broad terms about the Great Awakenings is that they have a lot of similarities every time, whereas the, the Great Crisis moments have some similarities, but have so far been, you know, unique moments in time. The Great Awakenings, they're all focused on young people. They were, up until the 1960s, the Fourth Great Awakening, all focused on Christianity exclusively. Um, they're focused on the idea of spreading the gospel, so the Christian message of you should become a Christian also. But there's some American aspects that get woven in. And one of those goes back to the Puritans and the idea of city on a hill, which if you remember when we talked about this now two years ago, the concept of city on a hill is this idea that, well, at that time, the Puritans in Massachusetts, but the Americans, as it gets em embraced by everyone, we're creating a society that should be copied. It should be emulated. We're like a city on a hill, so therefore you can see it. Now, they've taken Jesus from Matthew 5 out of context there. He's talking about individuals. But nonetheless, you get the point. Hey, you can see that city, so everybody's watching us, so let's do good. That was kind of the whole argument of Winthrop and the, and the Puritans at the time. And so that becomes a, a woven-in piece of it. When John F. Kennedy calls and creates the Peace Corps, he is talking about city on a hill. We're going to send our young people around the globe in order to do what? To help these other nations copy us, right? It's, I mean, there's more the Peace Corps did, but that's the basics behind it. So again, I'm not sure Kennedy knew he was saying it, but he was basically reflecting this whole idea. And so you get this idea of this energy of going into somewhere that doesn't have this news yet. And so early, our first three Great Awakenings are all traversing the continent. So the first Great Awakening in 1740, one of the outcomes is this wave of missionary zeal into the frontier of Western Pennsylvania, Kentucky, Indiana, Mississippi. That was the wild, wild west at the time. So taking and going. Now, 80 years later, between 1820 and 1840, same energy is going to go forward. And that's where Manifest Destiny is going to come from. The whole idea of going out. And if you really, we studied Manifest Destiny in this group a year last year. And when we looked at it, one of the things we talked about was how almost all, except for maybe Texas, of that was really pushed initially by these kind of religious people. But there's a second factor that occurs for the Second Great Awakening, and that is that the rise of the Second Abolition Movement begins. And for them, they're again bouncing off of the city on a hill concept. And their minds are going, yes, we are trying to create a society that's emulatable. Ergo, it would not have slavery. And so they're going to begin a fight. And these two forces, Manifest Destiny and the Second Great Awakening, are what's going to really lead to the ultimate conclusion and the ultimate clash that we cannot blend these two ideas together or slavery and not slavery. So we're going to charge forward and say, what is this abolition movement, right? These people were determined to fight back. Now, remember last time we talked about how it was out of the Americas and the American experience in colonization that an abolition force began in the 17, 1770s, 1760s, 1770s. Certainly there were pieces of it in England, but they were Wilberforce, the Clapham Society. They were to a large degree looking back at the colonies and saying, yeah, that's not good. We need to stop that. Not just in the Americas, in the Bahamas, in the African slave trade, all that stuff that we, England, are doing. But we, we get a piece of that, right? Remember, in Philadelphia, there was the first anti-slavery you know, conference, basically, in 1775. Well, but between then and, you know, like we said, through the Missouri Compromise, kind of had died out. But now, a new generation 
of young American leaders in their 30s and 40s, particularly coming out of the Second Great Awakening, which is calling you to faith, reminding you of the story of Jesus and goodness and, and Christianity, and centered on City on a Hill, they were like, you know what? No, no, we're not going to compromise anymore. Remember, one of the aspects of the Constitution is that it um, is built around this ambiguity that allowed for compromise, which we've already noted was useful. But for this group, compromise, when it involved what they perceived to be an evil, can't do it, not going to do it. And so they begin to fight it. And the real leading voice for us, um, Walker's appeal is very important, but it's William Lloyd Garrison. William Lloyd Garrison is, is correctly the kind of main figure, father, perhaps is too strong, but certainly the main figure that you see of an American who had just said, I'm not going to take it anymore. He was jailed several times. He was, he was fined several times. He said in one court case, after he was fined, I consider this me paying for my license to continue to fight and do anything possible to free these slaves. And of course, these are cases in the North. These aren't Southern cases where he's being fined and arrested and, and jailed for a variety of things helping slaves. So he really begins to fight, and it's with Garrison that you begin to get this idea of using the printing press is gonna be the best avenue. The, the decision to use propaganda and communication to try to weave the story, which of course is a historically old idea, but the abolitionists were like, you know what, we're going to do this. And they basically began to set up a series of strategies. So we're going to have a writing strategy. We're going to have an activist strategy, which we're about to look at in Underground Railroad. And we're going to have a political strategy. And so they'll begin to create our next iteration of third parties, which I'll show you more in just a second. It's at one of Garrison's um, rallies that we pick up the other. It's almost like these two are both the, the two main pillars. So that's why I don't like to call Garrison the father alone, because Frederick Douglass was a vital and critical figure. Now, to be make sure you're clear, he's not the only one, right? It's, it's, it's always a challenge for historians because we tell the story around the people that we know the most about who typically become the leaders. But you and I know from our own lives, the faceless, the nameless, the average people like me and maybe some of you who won't be remembered in history, we are active participants in this story in the year 2020, and there were many people. One of the beautiful things about the, the, the new abolition movement is the fact that it was a biracial movement. It was arguably the first biracial movement in the history of the world um, where these people worked hand in hand African-American and white European um, to try to solve and make the world a better place. And Douglas is vital to be the equal, in my opinion, to Garrison, um, articulate, thoughtful. Um, he began to write his own, um, his own paper uh, along with the liberators. So Garrison's doing his, Douglas is writing his called the North Star. Um, Gary, uh, Douglas writes his own autobiography, and remember, this is in a time when for most people, many white people can't read, but of course no black person can read and write. And then here's this, in fact, here's this articulate man writing his own autobiography. There are many who claim that a ghostwriter had to have written it for him, and, and Douglas and, and Garrison and others would go on the stump and, and basically prove that Douglas was this intelligent man that they saw and heard standing before them, and that he had written all you know his own works and stuff. There's so many stories here. I love the story of William Still. Most people don't know William Still, um, but he was really the principal leader of the abolition movement in, in Philadelphia. Most people don't realize that if you look at the Underground Railroad map, I'll come back to this picture in a second. If you look at this map, the western part all goes through the Midwest, with the Ohio River being like the critical boundary. And so all along the river, and in particular in Ohio, Ohio was really a hotbed for um, the abolition movement. It was really a hotbed here. And so all along the river, this is why if you go to the city of Cincinnati today, the National Underground Railroad is located in Cincinnati. And there are several towns along the river. And one of the most important is the river of Ripley. And you can see here two names, Rankin and Parker. 
Rankin is a white minister. Parker was a black man who owned his own company, owned a foundry. Um, he put his own daughters through school. Um, Parker uh, is really almost anonymous to us. We don't have a photo of what he looked like. We do know, again, he was African American. And Rankin and Parker are two that we know of the many that we don't know. But these men and women literally gave their lives. There were some who were active in the sense of traveling. So Harriet Tubman is the most famous example. Her movie, there was a movie about her just last year. I hope you've seen it. It's a very good one. It's, it's largely historically accurate. So I like to throw that. But that, no, no Hollywood movie is ever historically accurate, um, but it, it, this one comes close. And, uh, and so Tubman was somebody who would actively go. I love the Tubman movie because it, movie, movie, sorry, because it showed how she often partnered with uh, black se seamen who were on boats. So a key part of the Underground Railroad actually occurs by water. And you had seamen from the north who were black, and that was a job that they had, who worked in the Underground Railroad. White people too, sometimes. Um, and so you have both East and West, you have writers like Harriet Beecher Stowe, you have people who are giving speeches like William Moore Garrison and Douglas. And it's just this multifaceted group um, that is presenting this information. Here, here's an amazing photo, that's Garrison standing behind Douglas at a, at a rally that they were giving in New York. Um, and you can see in the photo that it's a, a biracial and also male and female group. Um, one of the good things the movie does in Harry Beecher Stowe is it shows her interfacing with William Still because she was in the East Coast side of things. And she will not allow him to be patriarchal to her. I mean, she's going to go do what she needs to do as an equal. And so you have a beginning also of the, of the women's movement coming out of this as well. So the Underground Railroad was a critical piece in getting people free and by the time you get to the 1840s 1850s arguably a thousand a year are getting free now remember at this point there's probably about four million slaves in the south so it's still a small percentage but it's 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 enough to be felt and it is this movement and this aggression of the abolition movement that really is going to stoke the fire of the southerners that's going to lead to the sectionalism which is why Manifest Destiny takes on this sectional slavery tone, particularly as it relates to Texas. So Manifest Destiny is this other piece that brings us out of the same Great Awakening. Again, we covered this. If you were with me when we covered this back in 2019, you're going to see some familiar slides and, and, and images here. Um, this, the Manifest Destiny is this kind of post-Lewis and Clark moment covering all this land. Like what, what do we do with all this land? And of course, the, the western southern part is all owned by another country, Spain. But in the early 1800s, 1810, 1820, um, they will lose control of all their new American uh, uh, holdings. And the states that we know, Colombia, Paraguay, and Argentina, and Chile, uh, and Mexico, will all emerge at this point. And so there's this new country of Mexico that has this other half of, of the continent. So this plays a role into the manifest destiny ethos. But just keep in mind that you've got this movement of go west, young man, go west, which you know, had started really with the founding of the country. And as it goes west and it's birthed out of the same Great Awakening, we come back to Locke, right? If the individual human, in this country, white human, has uh, the right to property, and we're in a limited power of government, like we talked about, Locke would propose, can the government limit where I take my property? Well, prior to the abolition movement, the answer would have been, I don't know, probably not. But now the abolition movement is going to fight this on this point and say, we might not be able to stop it in total in the South, but we sure as heck can stop it from spreading into land where it doesn't exist right now. So again, you have this really key moment, I keep trying to stress this for you guys, about how this is weaving together, all coming out of the same Great Awakening, and really talking to some degree about who should the country be, right? Should the country manifest destiny, go see the shining sea, if you do, what do you do with the people living there? Should this country be a, a country that, 
you know, purports to be for liberty to, you know, free people from the tyranny of nobility in Europe? If so, how do we have slavery? A lot of questions that aren't being answered at this point. So Manifest Destiny leads us to what we looked at, again, we went way in depth here, of what happens with Texas. Let me go back to this map really quickly. This land over here on the, the light brown where you see San Antonio, this was the most northern state of Mexico called Tejas. And when we signed a treaty with the Spanish in 18. 20, the Adams Onus Treaty for John Quincy Adams, who at that time was Secretary of State, we promised we would not take their land. Unfortunately for Mexico, they, they, they just struggled to make things work out. That's, that's, there's, a, there's some reasons we covered them before. But in that struggle, the people in Tejas began to chafe under what they perceived to be changing rules within the Mexican story. Most notably, the Mexican government will abolish slavery. They were the first country in the Western Hemisphere to abolish slavery. And so now, all of a sudden, if you were trying to be a slaveholder in Eastern Texas, where we showed you on the map, it worked really good to, to grow cotton, now you got a problem. And both Anglos and Hispanics were slaveholders and cotton farmers. So they both were kind of like, ah, this isn't good. And ultimately that will lead to the revolt that we all know of, the Texas Revolution, and they will be successful in 1836 in gaining their independence. Somewhat. Mexico will argue this point for the next 10 years. They'll lose the argument, but they'll keep arguing the point, which again, we went into the depths on it. What is interesting is if I just, if you just knew Manifest Destiny, and then we learned, hey, there's this place called Texas that wants to join our country. Well, you would think it's a slam dunk. That should be easy, right? But instead, it's not easy because of all this pressure. You've got the American system creating this economic scenario by which both North and South are gaining wealth. It's working. Henry Clay's ideas based on Hamilton's concept, Alexander Hamilton's, it's working. But now, with the anti-slavery movement also coming out of the same Great Awakening, they are going to do everything possible to stop annexation, and they will for eight long years. And so in this, we come to the very critical, I'm just check my time real quick. Oh, we got this. Uh, the really critical 1844 election. It's one of the most important elections in our national history. Um, and so many people don't, don't realize how big this one is. When you walk into it, let me back up for a second and show you some of our political history. We've covered this before. Bef under Jefferson, after his victory in 1800, really the Republican Party, because that's what Jefferson called it, was the only party for you know, 24 years. The 1824 election between John Quincy Adams, Jackson, Clay, and another man, Crawford, begins to split that party into two groups. Jackson, going into the 28th election, will claim, hey, we're the Democratic Republicans because he perceived that he had gotten ripped off in the vote. His actions as president, he'll be successful in 28 and again in 32, his actions as president will lead to the rise of another third party called the Whig Party, which was using the title of a political party in England that opposed monarchy, loosely stated. So you can see they're using that title to cast aspersions on Jackson. So they will battle for 34, 33 on the Democrats versus the Whigs. And you can see some of the key players there in the story. But as we just saw, with the coming of the second abolition movement, or the new abolition movement, they have those three efforts, right? The writing, the activist, Underground Railroad, but also the politics. So they create a third party, again, Liberty Party. And for eight years, four, uh, two presidential elections, three really, um, they will run candidates. Now, anybody who wanted to be in a third party these days could take a lesson from the abolition parties because they never made their focus the president. Their focus was always grassroots throughout all the states, representatives, local leaders, governors, 
That was the that was the clue. All of our third parties these days always focus on the presidency, which is a lost and losing effort. Sorry, I digress. Sorry. So the Liberty Party is going to play a role in this 1844 election. Now the Whigs had won the 1840 election, but unfortunately William Henry Harrison, who was the president at the inauguration, was rainy, cold, didn't wear a hat catches pneumonia, dies early. He was the first president to die in office. And I was like, what do we do? Well, his vice president was a man named Tyler. He was actually not a Whig. He'd formerly been a Democrat because the Whigs were a third party. So that there weren't a lot of Whigs. He rules as, um, as a Democrat more than the Whigs. So going in, there's this tension around Tyler, around 1844, around Manifest Destiny around Texas. It was a very explosive time. I'm not sure it's necessarily as explosive as 1860 or 2020, but it's close. It was a really, really big deal. And you had another issue on the table as far as Manifest Destiny was concerned up with Oregon. So you may remember that when Lewis and Clark get out to the Pacific Northwest, we claimed it. And we hadn't bought that part. That was a part of Louisiana territory. Well, the British, of course, had claimed it too. Of course, so had the Mexicans, and, I mean, the Spanish, and so had the Russians. And so ultimately, in 1819, same time as the other treaty with Spain, John Quincy Adams gets a treaty with England in which we agree to jointly occupy it for 20 years. Well, okay, move forward. You're basically in the same time period. And both countries wanted it. We actually had more people living there because of Manifest Destiny. Mostly Methodist missionaries will move out to Oregon. And again, we say Oregon, they meant all this. Now they were largely focusing on the Columbia River, but all this was in their mind. And so as you head into 44 election, uh, Oregon's also on the table. Now, this may be the last thing we get to tonight, but when you get to this moment with Tyler as the president, he's the, he was the former vice president, the other guy dies, there's, a, there's an event that happens, which we don't need to get into, but basically uh, a tragedy happens in D.C. with several people dying, um, political figures, and one of them was Tyler's Secretary of State. When this man dies, he will turn to John C. Calhoun. Now, John C. Calhoun is there with Henry Clay and Daniel Webster as the great triumvirate of Congress. And when you put in John Quincy Adams, Thomas Benton, and Andrew Jackson, you kind of have this, this set of who are the power players uh, in D.C. at this time. And between his arrival in D.C. at the time of the War of 1812, one of the early war hawks, and now Clay had begun to see himself as the only voice for the South. And it's with Clay that you begin to get this idea of the South making that transition philosophically from where slavery is a necessary evil, oh, I'm so ashamed, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have done this, to no, 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 it's a positive good. We should be talking about it openly. Yes, we have slaves. It's a good thing for everybody. And John C. Calhoun is the leading figure in that. And the fact that he gets to become the Secretary of State is how that happens. So at this moment, going in right before the election, the issue with Texas is potentially going to be settled. See, other people wanted Texas. England wanted Texas. Because if England could get Texas, there's always a chance that they could somehow loop from Canada down to Texas along or behind the Mississippi and block the United States. England's not unaware by this point that their greatest rival is going to become the United States. We're not friends at all at this point, but England doesn't want to go to another war if they can avoid it. And they realize a, a completely united North American continent would be bad for England. So Texas leaders, having been rebuffed for eight years, were like, okay, fine, we'll, we'll turn to England. And Tyler, having put Calhoun, Calhoun's like, look, we need Texas. The country needs Texas, but the South needs Texas. So he writes a letter to the English diplomat, the English ambassador, Richard Packingham, and basically threatens him. And he's like, look, you're not getting Texas because we're taking Texas. And we're taking Texas because it's for slavery. We're not going to let you impact our economy. 
And so it's a shocking letter to everybody because it's so candid. Clay doesn't hide anything. He's not apologizing for anything. Three fifths compromise. Yep, we did that. What's the problem? Why don't you like it? Um, he's not backing down. It's one of the most striking moments. In one sense, he's very courageous. And there's another sense where all I mean, when you read the letter, it, it, you're just like, he wrote that? And sort of like some of the tweets you see today. Although today, I sometimes think people who use Twitter, I don't. I think they don't realize what they're writing when they write it, and they shouldn't have pressed send. Calhoun knew exactly what he was writing and was intentional about the whole thing, and he pressed send on purpose. And so when this happened, the, the issue about Texas, which does obviously eventually involve Mexico, all centers around slavery. And this highlights for everyone that there's going to be a battle about slavery involving this land. By this point, the Southerners had recognized that with the Missouri Compromise, they kind of got ripped off. They, they, they didn't get like an equal station of the land. Um, had they seen a map that would have drawn the line maybe at the northern border of Missouri instead of the southern border of Missouri. And so they are not unaware that forces are building, now they would say it, to ruin our culture and our economy. And we can't let that happen. And so now Texas falls into the center of it. And next week what we'll do is we'll start right there with what ultimately is the road to the Mexican Revolution. And then we'll keep going and look and see well, what happens with that land in 1850. And that will be the kind of run into the full on road to the Civil War, which goes from the Mexican War ending in 48 through Lincoln's election in 1860. So these two days have kind of given us some, some context, um, some kind of foundation. I want to pause again and just see if anybody has a question. There's been a few things um, that were, were written to me in the, in the chat about um, some things that were said, but I think they're private, which is totally fine, of course. Um, I do think um, we need to know more as a society about modern day slavery. And I, if you want to know more about that, I think all of you have a way to email me, or you certainly can get it from Becca. I've emailed several of you privately for different reasons. I will give you a ton of information if you're interested about that. We should care that it's in this society. What we're about to talk about with slavery um, and the 13th Amendment eventually, it didn't end slavery. It passed a law and it ended open slavery that we're used to thinking about from the movies about people in fields, but it didn't end slavery. And uh, we should still fight for it. But is there any question about anything we've covered, that same great awakening, um, the coming of the challenge, the abolition movement, anything? I'll just pause for a second, as I like to do. Well, I thank you so much for being with me. Uh, this is session two. I, I've been trying to keep up. I think we're going to have at least eight or nine of these. Hopefully you're ready. And uh, maybe we'll be able to get them all done before I come back. And who knows? We'll see how that works out. Again, I, um, I appreciate your time. And I thank you so much for for being here. I'm going to go ahead and stop the share um, so we can get off here and I'll stop the uh, stop the video. I uh, appreciate you guys.